So yeah, this is our 2016 John Swan uh, Vermont Library Intellectual Freedom Lecture. Um, the series has been going on since 1992. John Swan was um, former director at uh, uh, Library Director at Benning College, and uh, this series was named after him. Uh, he was a he was Thomas defender of uh, um, of intellectual freedom in you know, libraries, and he I think left a, a decent sum of money for an endowment so that we, we could periodically have some talks and address the issues you know, that, that, you know, that affect intellectual freedom. And, uh, you know, the, uh, after reading your book, uh, which I have a copy right over there, uh, you know, it got me to thinking about issues, um, you know, you raised some of the issues of sort of some of, some of, the, some of the pioneers of, um, you know, the digital world going back as far as, Van Bush's 40, 1948, was that his, right. his piece? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah. 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 And, um, and talking about, you know, this idea of this, this sort of global repository of free information, you know, that can be accessed by anyone, and, you know, the idea that it would improve humanity. Um, and, you know, of course, eventually people figured out that there was an interest in, in restricting that information, walling it off, making people pay for it. Um, and, you know, I mean, you have, we have today, as, as I, mean, I saw as your piece the other day about journal pricing, uh, you yeah, know, that fits in there. And I'm sure you know, you probably know plenty about Elsevier. I don't know if you deal with, uh, with periodicals. Um, you know, that some of these companies that don't pay the authors anything, they just distribute the information and make amazing profits. Uh, I think Elsevier is the most notorious in terms of their profit margins. Um, when you have generally, I think, unpaid editors, unpaid authors, um, it's it's a great gig uh, if you can if you can get it, I guess. Um, you know, and then you have the people really fighting to to make sure that in, uh, information is free and open. Um, and uh, sometimes some people have taken some daring, shall we call it, you know, steps to get some of this information out there and paid a pretty happy price for it. Um, and that is also the topic of Justin's book, uh, The Idealist. Um, Aaron Swartz, The Rise of Free Culture on the Internet, recently published by Charles Scribbins and Son. Uh, and Justin, if you didn't know, Justin's also, he writes for Slate. Uh, and I've seen it, a, are you a contributing editor? Contributing editor to Columbia Journalism. Which is a, uh, I, mean, that, I mean, that is one of the premier journalism publications, is it not? It's pretty much the only premier <laughs> 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 something that 
when you think about it, barely warrants the title crime uh, at all. A violation, perhaps. Uh, but we live in a world where uh, unauthorized and excessive downloading, uh, if it gets into the hands of uh, sort of federal prosecutors who are determined to make a name for themselves, can lead to 13 uh, federal felony charges uh, with a potential maximum penalty of 95 years in prison and over $3 million in fines. Uh, that's what Aaron Swartz was facing uh, when he chose to end his life in uh, January 2013. Um, he was never really going to... Uh, <laughs> it was mostly there as um, sort of an inducement for him and his lawyers to sort of uh, come to a plea bargain with uh, the prosecutors. Uh, but the prosecutors were adamant that whatever sort of like plea bargain line they came to, Swartz would have to spend some time in prison. Uh, Swartz didn't want to spend any time uh, in prison, uh, primarily because uh, he refused to sort of acknowledge or accept that what he had done uh, was actually a crime, was a jail uh, offense. Uh, now, what did he do? Um, in September 2010, he went into um, uh, the lobby of Building 7 at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, opened up his laptop, co connected to uh, MIT libraries, um, and started downloading articles from JSTOR. I'm sure everyone here knows what JSTOR is. I don't need to belabor uh, <laughs> like the point, right? Um, the, the interesting thing about MIT at that point in time is that their computer network was completely open, uh, even to guests, which meant that any guest could sort of walk in uh, sign on to the network and have full sort of access to the school's library resources for I think a two week sort of uninterrupted life period. Then they needed to sort of refresh their credentials. They could have you know, further access and like so on and so forth. Uh, so just starting to download papers wasn't in itself explicitly forbidden. Um, what Swartz did is um, he uh, used a computer program to sort of automate the download. And that's when he started getting trouble because the JSTOR Terms of Service uh, forbids the use of automa uh, automated uh, bulk downloading. Um, and the Terms of Service are stated on one of those long sort of scrolly uh, pop-up windows of text that uh, everyone just sort of like clicks uh, yes to and sort of like moves through. Um, whether or not Swartz read the text, I don't know. What we do know is that his, um, his crawler, his program that he built, started downloading JSTOR articles with great rapidity, hundreds of uh, articles per second, um, to the point where uh, it actually crashed the JSTOR servers in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, JSTOR had no idea who was taking um, these articles. They had no idea what actually was happening, other than uh, their servers had gone down. And it had gone down because of these sort of uh, furious download requests. And they were afraid it was a Chinese. I went through all of the sort of internal emails that, uh, staff emails that JSTOR has sort of um, uh, released to the public, and they were very clear that they were afraid that these were uh, a group of sort of overseas, probably Chinese hackers, um, who they feared were going to take the entire corpus and distribute it and file in their file sharing networks like somewhere in China. Um, so they really wanted to stop this person, or these people, whoever they were. So they blocked uh, the Swartz's IP address. Uh, he tweaked his settings and sort of found another way back on the network. They blocked him again. Soon they blocked access to MIT in general. Mm -hmm. um, and that happened for like three days, right in the middle of the academic year, right? You can understand what a sort of uh, big move like this is. Like that's something that JSTOR just doesn't want to do because as soon as JSTOR is down, you start getting emails from people saying, well, I need JSTOR right now. I have midterms. I have a paper. I have a grant. Um, it was down for about three days. Then it came back up. And then they thought the problem was solved. Um, and this was in October 2010. In December 2010, they realized that it wasn't. It, it, had, it had never been solved. And in fact, uh, what Swartz had done is he had tweaked his tactics. Um, to not trigger the sort of alerts for the JSTOR staffers. He had taken his laptop down to a basement wiring telephony closet 
in MIT, plugged it directly into um, the network, and started downloading um, articles steadily and slowly, to the point where when the uh, MIT technical uh, services team discovered the laptop, it had been going for uh, several months, and it downloaded almost five million uh, academic journal articles, like from JSTOR. Yeah, a substantial portion of the entire corpus. Now, all they had at that point, uh, the tech team at MIT, was a laptop, and uh, sort of these articles that were being siphoned, sort of like constantly. They had no idea who had done it, but they wanted to find out, so they set up a trap. Right? They set up a camera in this closet. Uh, they um, did something to um, the sort of computer so that it would alert MIT police immediately if it was removed from the network. Uh, three days later, uh, Swartz came into the closet um, to sort of like remove the laptop. And when you look at the security pictures, you'll see him sort of covering his face with his bicycle helmet as if he realized that something is different, right? But it didn't cover his face uh, enough. It's still clear that it was like it was Aaron Swartz. This was at about 12.25 p.m. on January 6th. Excuse me, who is that? Oh, you guys can have a little bit of your life. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. My mom had a about you. So they arrested him, right? Uh, eventually, like, they identified him at about 12.20 on January 6th. At uh, 2.20 on January 6th, uh, the uh, MIT police recognized someone going down Mass Ave in Cambridge who substantially resembled the uh, photograph in that the security cameras had taken. They chased him down the street, they tackled him in a parking lot. He was about two blocks away from his own sort of apartment when they brought him in. And when they brought him in, this is where the mystery just starts, right? Instead of, like, the arrest clearing things up, it just made things more confusing. Aaron Swartz wasn't a Chinese hacker, right? He wasn't a vandal. He wasn't malicious. He wasn't working for um, Anonymous or any of the groups that you hear of. That when you hear their name, you're supposed to get scared. Aaron Swartz was famous. He'd been famous since childhood, literally since childhood. He'd been a computer prodigy since age his birth, basically, and the world had like started recognizing this at like age 13, when he became sort of substantive, substantively involved in writing the uh, RSS 2.0 uh, standard. Um, a few years after that, um, he got involved with uh, Creative Commons. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, with uh, Lawrence Lessig and Eric Elbridge. Reddit 
uh, he made himself such a nuisance, like in the offense, uh, uh, that they basically said, you have to go. Um, that's what he wanted, and he went. And from then, this was early 2007, until the day he died, he spent his entire sort of life focused on open information projects, right? Um, he was involved with uh, Brewster Kell in helping to uh, create the uh, Open Library, um, which, as I'm sure you know, you know, was, you know, at the time seen as a sort of uh, open alternative to uh, Google Print for libraries, which eventually became Google Books. Um, he um, helped this guy named Carl Malamud, uh, along with Richard Kell, uh, download 20 million pages worth of documents from the uh, PACER archive of U.S. courts records. Um, he did this in much the same way that he started downloading stuff from the JSTOR, right? He exploited this um, uh, weakness in there, basically, you like you exploited this free trial program that uh, the U.S. courts had, where if you went to one of I think 16 federal depository libraries around the country and sort of used one of their computers there, you could download as many sort of Pacer records as you want. Are we all familiar with what Pacer? Yeah, I forget what the acronym stands for. Yeah, it's a yeah, federal X it, something. Electronic court records, I forget what the acronym yeah, stands for, too. <laughs> anyway, so like, we all know, like, yeah, you have to pay 10 cents a page like, to like, download it, right? For a limited time, if you went to one of these libraries, you could get as much as you wanted for free. What Swartz did is he had to send a friend to one of those libraries, had him download an authentication cookie that um, Swartz could then use from his uh, apartment in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to basically trick Pacer into thinking that he was sitting in Sacramento, downloading millions and millions of... Uh, uh, documents. Uh, well, the FBI sort of started investigating him. Um, he had downloaded 20 million sort of like documents um, at that point, and um, the FBI initially treated that like as a crime, or as a potential crime, because they knew something had happened, and they weren't quite sure what Swartz wanted with that material or what it was going to do with it. So they sent the um, uh, feds to um, sort of surveil his parents' house and tried to get him to um, come and meet with them and one thing or another, nothing came of that like immediately, right? Indirectly, you know, the, that was clearly like the moment that the federal government first started sort of taking an interest in sort of like sports. So this is all sort of like background to um, his eventual arrest in 2011, his eventual suicide in 2013. It's pretty much where I come into the story. Um, I grew up on the North Shore of Chicago, much like Aaron Sports did. I grew up, I, I've driven, it's about a 12 minute drive from my childhood house um, to his. I didn't know him when I was growing up or afterwards. Uh, I'd heard of him, and I mean, it's hard to spend much time on the internet without hearing his name or being, you know, taking part in something he had you know, helped build. Um, I didn't know anything about his story, really, until my editors at Slate in January 2013 uh, came to me and said, hey, you want to write about this kid who died? I don't know why they came to me. I was covering crime at the time. It, um, I think maybe Farhad Manju was busy that day, and like, <laughs> I couldn't take the story, so they came to me. It was still, it's basically a crime story, right? There is elements of a crime story um, to that, uh, you know. Genius gets in trouble with the law, you know, commits suicide. Peters, go find out uh, what happened. So I flew to his funeral on January 14th, uh, 2013. I spent the next sort of uh, three and a half weeks um, really sort of like crashing on this story. Talked to every single person I'd ever met. Uh, well, every single person I could, you know, come into contact with who had met him, who had known him ranging from his father and his girlfriend to the guy who'd driven his bus at, at summer camp in like in second grade, his eighth grade gym teacher. He did not have much to say. <laughs> you know? But you know, you, you, you talk to these people and you try to piece together a story. And the story I pieced together was 15,000 words long. And when it was published, uh, it was the first time I've ever felt that something that long was just the beginning, right? The beginning of the tale. 
because the story that I wrote was basically just focused on Aaron Swartz, focused on his sort of details of his biography, his life, and his death, right? But in the course of sort of like writing this and coming to understand a little bit, and just really sort of peek into his world, the more I sort of like realized that his story uh, of his life, you know, is really sort of an entry point into a broader story about the society in which like he lived and worked, um, the causes in which he believed, um, and the laws that ultimately sort of brought him down. I'll never forget this. Um, I, was, I, I was reading uh, and he you know, did sort of paperwork um, and stuff sort of around the time of his initial sort of indictment. Uh, I remember sort of like reading this quote from Carmen M. Ortiz, the U.S. attorney like in Boston, and just sort of like staring at it. She said, stealing is stealing. Whether you use a uh, crowbar or computer command, whether you take documents, data, or dollars, Stealing is stealing, and as I continue to think about that, you know, it seems so certain, right? Such certitude, like behind, like that quote. Sure, any fourth grader can sort of uh, unknows as much. If it's not yours, like don't take it. Stealing is wrong. But when you start talking about what Aaron Swartz did, you know, this sort of like, um, was that stealing? Is stealing stealing? How did we get to the point, like, where that becomes a sort of dominant mentality um, in um, American jurisprudence? How did we get to the point where, as a society, where um, downloading academic journal articles becomes uh, a federal crime, you know, uh, uh, punishable by uh, 95 years in prison? And how did we get to the point where academic journal articles become considered private property? Yeah, and accessing them is considered stealing just as much as like taking a you know, bottle of pop off the shelf would be, or you know, stealing someone's boat, right? And these are the questions that really started, you know, trying to motivate me uh, as I was sort of like reading and about this. As I started writing this book, um, our sports is like faces on the cover here, uh, but I think it's a bit of a um, it's a bit of bait and switch, uh, because if you pick up the book, uh, he, the first chapter is about him, but then I go away from him for about 120 pages, and I talk about the history of sort of copyright in this country, and the history of um, the, the sort of dueling ideas that information wants to be free, and information wants to be expensive. Information wants to be free, it's a bumper sticker that we've all basically heard or seen. Right? It's a pithy sort of like statement. It sort of resounds. Of course, information wants to be free. You know, let it take the air. Uh, and when Stuart Brand, the um, co-founder of the Whole Earth Catalog, you know, first uh, uttered these words at the inaugural Hackers Conference in California in like 1984, you know, it seemed a mission statement, right? And you know, it has continued to be sort of a mission statement. Um, for people who sort of align themselves with you know, the free culture movement these days. Uh, but not as well known as what Brand said immediately thereafter, right? Information wants to be free. Information also wants to be expensive, right? Because it is so valuable to so many people. And Brand's paradox, the paradox that he sort of like set out right there, right? The tension, it never goes away. It is never, like, it's always been there. And it always will sort of like be there. The more I started sort of looking into um, the history of the sort of movement of ideas throughout um, this country, the more I realized that you have to understand um, where these sort of dueling notions like came from and how the one information wants to be expensive came to be so uh, dominant uh, today. Uh, from a point where they started up pretty much equal, right? Uh, to understand why Aaron Swartz was facing 95 years uh, in prison. Um, and if it's okay with the three of you, um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time just going through the history of sort of copyright 
and intellectual property um, in this country. Is that okay? Yeah, right. I've got um, your grandma little cheese to help me. Yeah, I'm sure. sure. Critically, a renewal right could now be passed to an immediate family member. 
owners, right? So this is a critical moment in the history of uh, intellectual property as property in this notion. Because now um, a copyright on a work is terrible, right? Now it's something that can be passed like down. Um, it's like this chair or like something like else a physical object, right? This sort of like, sort of is one of the first steps toward solidifying like the notion that uh, work of uh, the brain, brain work, is something that belongs primarily to sort of its owner, rather, or its creator, rather than something that belongs like to the world, right? Uh, but this notion wasn't sort of ensconced uh, quite yet, um, because when they passed the uh, Copyright Act of 1790 and then the one of 1831, they neglected to include um, overseas works. So works that had been sort of created in the United States had full copyright protections. But um, works that had been created sort of outside of the United States, in you know, Great Britain or France or whatever, um, the authors had no claim to copyright uh, within US borders. Um, this was a great thing for the people of America and for the publishers of America because it meant that the publishers of America trying to build their sort of like businesses uh, in sort of a nation that still is not, you know, mainly literate uh, with very sort of like rudimentary uh, distribution uh, channels. You know, the first railroad uh, are starting to be built. Like around now, roads are still sort of like horrible. Um, it's very hard to get this sort of you know, national sort of distribution that you'd actually need to build a business if you have to put down like a lot of sort of like money to acquire um, a book. But if you have to put down zero money to acquire uh, the latest books by say Schultz or Scott or Charles Dickens or something, right? So this is what happens. You know, the American sort of publishing industry is built on the backs of sort of essentially pirated uh, works from overseas. Right? Um, this is how it would work. There would be a ship coming um, overseas with um, the sort of printing plates for um, a book that had just come out, say, um, the latest of uh, Scott's uh, Gothic-like novels, the latest little Waverly novel or whatever, right? Um, um, this book would sort of hit um, the uh, bookstores or what have you. About a day or two after it, you know, the plates come uh, across. About a day or two after the first sort of copy, like, hits, like, stores, dozens of other sort of, like, like copies start hitting stores with other sort of, um, uh, sort of printers, you know, issuing their own, like, very cheap and very quick sort of, like, version of this, right? What this does, clearly, it drives down the price of literature, right? It also makes it easier for people um, who don't have much money to afford it and to find it, you know? Again, it's happened, you know, you know, with sort of the Gutenberg Press, you know, when there's more material sort of like out there in sort of a nation or a society where literacy is not sort of like prominent and, you know, people are scrabbling to sort of like improve their like stations, having better, you know, access to, you know, stuff that they might be able to like read and improve their minds by, or even if it doesn't need to be just sort of edif you know, edifying material, you know, having like something to fire their imaginations, you know, as they sort of like, you know, go to sleep huddling for warmth on like the planes, you know, that's a, that's a net positive, you know, that's something that you like, you want as a society. Uh, so like this starts to like circulate um, and the sort of readers of America start to actually read because they can sort of access what essentially is free content. I call this the first golden age of free content sort of in like the book because it's what it was. Um, it's great for Americans. It's horrible for Sir Walter Scott, who got a debtor in um, the uh, 18, early 1830s and in, in Britain. And a lot of his authorial peers, you know, never ever sat with America. They're like, well, if, if, if Scott had some uh, money from the sales of his books, you know, um, maybe he wouldn't have died, you know, uh, in such uh, dire straits. They sold 500,000 copies uh, of the Waverly novels in the U.S. He got zero dollars sort of like in um, that was a problem, for Scott, at least. It was a problem for Dickens, it was a problem for uh, Frederick Marriott, uh, the writer of nautical adventure novels, who um, his, um, his very sort of expensive taste, he was always sort of short 
on cash. And one day he was looking around thinking, where can I get sort of some more cash? You know, I need more money. All of my speculations are, you know, going wrong. I'm investing in tulips and like stuff like that. Um, Samaria comes to America to battle with the literary pirates. He doesn't have much to do, right? He goes around um, the, uh, the sort of East Coast, basically agitating like for international copyrights, right? Saying America needs to pass a copyright law that respects overseas work just as much as it respects sort of uh, domestic uh, It's right, it's the moral thing to do. And the response he gets is very interesting. It's especially interesting now when you think about how quick um, sort of legislators or U.S. attorneys are to uh, say that stealing is stealing, right? That you know, um, the um, work of creative production like, belongs to the producer or the person who looks like the copyright. Uh, and the only sort of interaction that um, the sort of uh, reader of America has with that material is like at the checkout line, right? Or when you swipe your credit card. So, with that in mind, it's interesting. The response that like, Marriott gets from Congress and from people where he gets there. And the congressman is telling him, like, wait, like, look, this is actually happening rather than me sort of characterizing. Um, festivities, 
including a sketch in which a prominent comedian, you know, playing Dickens, you know, says, um, oh, I must not quarrel with the trade, the publishing trade. Uh, in golden smiles more richly am I paid. Um, and Dickens' true sort of like feelings could not have been more different. And he spends his entire trip to America, you know, chiding um, Americans for their presumption that their countrymen's golden smiles were worth more than any banknote, right? Um, he, he says, oh, my, my, I boil and swell, you know, to puff out to ten times my size when I think of the enormities of this injustice. Um, but despite all the boiling and swelling, you know, nothing happened. Everyone was like, well, Dickens is dyspeptic, but we'll read his books for free anyway. And he goes back to Britain, and that's what happens, right? And like, this is basically uh, how America becomes a nation of readers. And it's also how America becomes sort of like a nation where there are publishers who are able to sort of like create this material and circulate it. Um, there is a growth in sort of like nat nat in national literature. 
Christ, right? But it's the sort of thing that uh, isn't going to be found in sort of um, the Athenaeum, right? You know, it's like these lurid, sort of like tales of crime or these sort of like cheap, like novels that people basically read, you know, while they're in transit, you know. Um, they read while they're um, on, the, the, uh, on the train. They read it, you know, coming home from sort of a hard day's like work. Um, the notion that copyright is the only thing that um, is necessary to spur the creation of culture, like in America, is really sort of a paternalistic like notion that what they're actually saying is it is like necessary to spur the court of sort of culture that we, the people in power, believe is culture, right? You know, but what America is basically doing is like, great, we're building this you know, culture from the bottom up. We're reading stuff that's cheap, and we're reading Sir Walter Scott, and we're reading Dickens, but we're also reading Frank Leslie's newspaper. We're reading, um, um, you know, Rachel Alder-like stories, and all of this sort of, like, cheap stuff. And we're the ones who are trying to determine what sort of uh, we want to read. And you can see these sort of direct parallels, you know, sort of like today, with the sort of, like, rise of user-generated, like, content. And, um... I, uh, there's this thing called Twitch. I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, but uh, if you have you know, like kids, like they almost certainly have, like mm -hmm. you, right, like you can watch people play video games. You watch people play video games. My husband's into it. So <laughs> it, that's, yeah. you watch people like they like live stream themselves like playing video games, Ooh. right? <laughs> and it's bizarre, and I don't understand it. But like Twitch is worth many billions of dollars, and like. There are more people like watching like these live streams of people playing video games than there are like actually buying books or going to like the actual sort of like movies, right? And this is an analogous situation because in the 19th century people were saying, people are reading dime novels, this is horrible. And today as an author, I'm saying people aren't buying my book, but they're watching Twitch. This is horrible. And it's not horrible, it just is the thing that people do, right? Like, when sort of the means of production become, like, sort of, like, cheaper and, like, there is, like, not uh, that much central sort of, like, control, people create stuff that they want to, like, see. And it is not necessarily the stuff that people who want to make money off of, you know, the production of high art, like, want them to sort of, like, see. Um, and this eventually became a problem in the 19th century for publishers who st wanted to start making sort of money like selling high art. Um, because what had happened in the sort of sweep of time as the Civil War ends and the railroads get better um, is that there had been sort of a group of white shoe sort of New York publishers. Like there had been the development of a publishing establishment. Right? And what these publishers had done is they had entered into arrangements with uh, various overseas authors like on their own. Right? There hadn't been, um, there's still no international copyright, uh, but there was something called the courtesy of the trade. What the courtesy of the trade was is if, say, Putnam's and Sons um, was the first to uh, publish, um, I don't know who's an author, um, like Dickens or something, right? Um, then, you know, Putnam had exclusive rights to Dickens, like, for, like, the, uh, until the end of time. Um, and the publishers got together, like, listen, let's just be gentlemen, like, about this, and let's stop undercutting, like, each other. And this allowed them to sort of, like, raise, slowly raise the prices on sort of, like, overseas um, uh, literature. So they were starting to make sort of profits, right? And with these profits, they were able to build, like, their business and their distribution, like, network. And as long as there's a sort of, like, underclass of, like, literature, you know, this sort of uh, dime novels and railroad literature, like, uh, there could be both tracks, right? But then there's another of the, you know, sort of regular, like, financial panics, like, sent the bottom out of the railroad literature, sort of, like, industry. Um, and it cheap as it was to sort of like create like their own content, it was still was too expensive uh, because like there was 
there was no money in America. So all of the sort of people that had been sort of creating this sort of like railroad sort of like literature, this like cheap domestic production, they're like, look, we've got this fiscal plant here, and what do we do, <laughs> right? Well, what they do is they go back to doing what um, the sort of white shoe publishers did when they got started. They start sort of like saying, well, forget trade currency. Like, we are going to take this material that, you know, Putnam and Sons is making a market for, and we're just going to sort of like pirate it and print our own sort of like versions. Um, and there's nothing to stop us, because there's no law against it. There never has been. There's just been this sort of old boys club sort of like arrangement. Uh, but we're not part of that club. We don't come from that world, and we don't respect it. Um, so in the 1880s, there, there's this new sort of like brand and sort of strain of quote unquote pirate publishers, right? And instead of um, being in opposition to uh, established publishers overseas, they're in opposition to established publishers like on the East Coast. And this is the moment where everything changes and where the copyright sort of like um, rhetoric uh, becomes, starts to become what it is like today. But morality really sort of enters into uh, the whole like, discussion because this is when um, publishers like Putnam, uh, hold on, I think I have a picture of Putnam here. There we go. Yeah, George Hayden Putnam takes action, right? Um, there have been few people who have been so sort of loudly and self sort of like um, self satisfiedly. Uh, uh, concerned with the health of the publishing industry as George Haven Putnam, who was, this, who was the sons in G.P. Putnam's uh, sons. And what Putnam did is he um, gets, in the 1880s, like, he gets the sort of rest, the Henry Holt and Charles Scribner and Appleton and all these people, and gets them together to start um, actually agitating for an international copyright law. Now, how do you get America to, uh, cop, uh, to vote for this law, to support this law. Because there's plenty of reasons not to, right? You know, the American reader doesn't want sort of copyrighted law. It's to the reader's benefit to have sort of uh, you know, material, like circular, to have more, right? Congress has traditionally not been in favor of, you know, strong copyright protections for overseas like content. It constitutes a tax on knowledge. That's what they say, that's what they call it, that's how they believe it, right? Like, why would they levy a tax on knowledge? They don't want to impose that. The constituents don't want that. Um, printers don't want sort of uh, international copyright uh, law. You know, it will give them less business. Um, so how to make the case? Well, you make it a moral case. And that was like the strategy of the um, American Publishers Copyright League American Authors Copyright League, these two sort of like organizations that Putnam and his cohort uh, set up to make the moral case for copyright to um, readers and printers who had every reason not to want this law that would work against their own sort of reading by interest. Um, so what they do is they actually go to a bunch of ministerial organizations and like ministers and they have them work this stuff into their Sunday sermons. There's this guy called uh, Henry Van Dyke. You should check out, um, this, this sermon is like published, I forget what it's called. Uh, but uh, the, 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 there's this great quote uh, that he says in it. It is altogether idle and irrelevant to talk of the lonely rancher in Dakota, the humble freedmen in the South, and their consuming desire to obtain cheap literature. My neighbor's passionate love of light has nothing to do with his right to carry off my candles. You see the shifting frame here, right? You know, it's this sort of assumption that there is a moral right to copyright, where that has never been the case in the United States. Um, copyright and sort of copyright law is solely a production incentive here. That is the text of the Copyright Law of 1831, of the Copyright Act of 1790. That is basically the case that, like, Webster made when he first started like agitating with this stuff. This is the logic that has animated copyright discussion in Congress. You know, since there first started being copyright discussions like in Congress, that it's a social relationship between sort of consumers, producers, like in the state, and all sort of parties' interests need to be uh, considered. But by reframing this as like a moral thing, 
reframing it, then, then it becomes okay to say, well, it's not relevant, like, to talk about, you know, you know, freed slaves in the South, or, like, poor ranchers, and, like, their, their passionate love of life, right? It doesn't matter, because they don't have a right to it. I have the right. I, the, the author, I, like, the publisher. It is my right. It is a copyright. It is intellectual property. Um, and this becomes, like, the, um, this becomes the refrain. And it takes about a decade for this refrain to like, sink in. But it eventually does. And in 1891, they pass um, an International Copyright um, Act. And through sheer sort of reiteration of uh, this sort of like notion of morality, they start actually sort of hammering it home. And this becomes a frame that dictates copyright right until like today, right? The sort of notion that there is this moral right like the problem. That my neighbor's, my neighbor's passionate love of life is altogether irrelevant, right? He has no right to carry off my candles. This is when it flips. This is when you stop hearing about a tax on knowledge in Congress. You stop hearing that uh, about the 13 millions of uh, uh, people who want something to read, as the legislator told Captain Marriott back in 1837. And it starts becoming sort of a matter of protecting uh, business interests. Um, this is also right around the same time that the public library becomes a thing. Um, and it's also uh, gigantic business interests that you know, start making like libraries of things as you all know. The Carnegie Libraries, you know, are basically he's Johnny Library C. You know, you know, Carnegie. Um, you know, it's a very sort of like complicated you know, figure in American history. We could sit here and talk for hours about his true motivations in wanting to, you know, start libraries like everywhere. Um, <laughs> I'm already talking a lot, so I'll just say it. But like, whatever, like it or not, he did, right? He started libraries everywhere, right? Um, and it wasn't just him. It was like major cities, right? The Boston Public Library in 1895, when that was sort of like founded. You know, it was like the biggest and sort of like best like major city library that had ever been constructed in the United States. It cost like $3 million. Um, it was like very much, you know, thought of and sort of um, meant to be a palace for the people, right? Free to all is inscribed above like the main sort of like entrance. Herbert Putnam, the main librarian of the Boston Public Library, when the new branch was sort of opened on Copley Square in 1895. Um, he's the son of George, uh, the brother of George Haven uh, Putnam, uh, the prime mover behind the International Copyright Act. Herbert Putnam's uh, a different cat, right? You know, um, he's one of the most fascinating sort of uh, figures of this era. He'd eventually go on to be Librarian of Congress for 40 years. Um, there's been one biography of him by Jane Rosenberg Aiken. There should be, um, it mainly focuses on his work at the library. There needs to be a biography of him as, a, as sort of an American figure. He's a fascinating uh, figure. And what he says at the inauguration um, is worth actually stating rather than paraphrasing. Um, the building is an uh, apotheosis of the confidence which the American people have come to feel in the public library as a branch of education. Um, it is the American public's conviction that literature being indispensable, books cannot, cannot be too greatly multiplied, or so far as the readers are concerned, too freely accessible. Right? So you get this sort of co-evolution here of strains of thought. Information wants to be expensive, information wants to be free. Right? You know, well, there's just been a law passed that makes information that had been freely available a little bit more expensive. But simultaneously, you know, that sort of, like, it, it sort of, like, jumped to, like, covalent shells, right? You know, and this sort of, all of this sort of, like, hope and sort of ambition that had been centered around the ready circulation of overseas literature, you know, jumps to the um, ready circulation of literature in, in public libraries, right? Like, now, at least, there is a place in every town of any size where the person who has the interest in, you know, bettering him or herself, 
you know, who might not have money or means, who might work for 15 hours like a day, you know, can still take books out and in candlelight, you know, uh, try to sort of advance his or her station. You can still sort of like walk down Main Street and see a building, right, that is devoted to the notion that in sort of like America, um, that, that sort of the ready circulation of culture, you know, means something. That this is like a central value of ours. And this is really what free culture means, right? And what does it always mean? It is not primarily a matter of price. It is to a point, you know, like free culture, when it circulates sort of like freely, you know, cheaper is like better, you know? People have always been poor, <laughs> you know? Like it's still, it's no different today. Those standards of living have sort of like risen, you know? But it's not primarily a price thing. It's a liberty thing, right? Free culture means that a nation becomes sort of more free when its citizens have free access to sort of information. When it's easier for them to sort of educate themselves and inspire themselves, and thus inspire sort of like others by having access to new and interesting and scandalous schismatical, heretical, and malicious ideas, right? Um, Do you have those on your shelves? <laughs> <laughs> Any good library should. Any good library should, right? We talked about old oh, 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 yeah. Um Yeah, libraries touch the community, says Herbert Putnam, as a whole, as perhaps there's no other single organized agency for good. And that was true in 1895, and it's still true um, today. And it was true when Putnam became librarian of Congress in 1899. He left Boston and he went down um, to sort of lead the library, the library, you know, into this era of unprecedented technological change. George Haven Putnam and you know, Charles Scribner and Henry Holt um, thought that they had um, saved culture sort of like in America. They had sort of uh, stopped barbarians sort of like at the gate by passing the sort of uh, Copyright Act of 1891. What the barbarians did was just build their machines. In the sort of like 15 years between, um, I'm sorry, this sort of like 18 years between the Copyright Law of uh, 1891 and the eventual packet, uh, passage of the omnibus copyright revision in 1909. It's the development of all sorts of new cultural and communicative technologies that fundamentally transform the notion of what it is to sort of, uh, of, what, of, what, of what culture is and how it's transmitted. And like, it, it becomes so much easier for sort of news and cultural information to infect the cultural brain, for these ideas to become like part of the critical conversation, right? You've got uh, recorded sound, you've got film cameras, you've got the electric light, which is a huge thing, because now people can read in the dark. Now you don't have to read by candlelight, right? That is massive. Like the, the page no longer disappears when, when, when night falls. You've got these, uh, this thing right here is called the, um, I'm showing you, it's called the Teleharmonic Dynaphone of Dr. Cato. Um, it um, was a thing that it was this brand new weird sort of like instrument with all sorts of like circuits and like like gears and like horns. And uh, for a minute there, people were like, well, is Dr. Cahill's telharmonic dynaphone like the future of like music and sound? And it wasn't, but no one knew. Nobody knew anything. Nobody knew what was going to be the future if everyone was going to have a telharmonic dynaphone in their parlor or, or not, right? And in sort of eras of great sort of like change and sort of uh, technological tunnel. Um, it's also times of great fear, right? Uh, for people who have made their uh, fortunes and have sort of uh, vested interest in um, having existing technologies, you know, maintain their civil supremacy, right? Um, so with new technologies come sort of the sort of need or sort of hunger for new copyright laws to uh, govern these technologies. And it becomes Herbert Putnam's job uh, to oversee the development of this law. Because as Librarian of Congress, he oversees the Register of Copyrights. Um, so 
when he gets to um, town, he had a player piano, his talking machine, I'll look at that again. Um, he works to revise copyright laws. Um, so what he does is he gets um, a bunch of, he gathers uh, about 30 men and two women like together in the Library of Congress and later in the City Club of New York. We start hammering out the sort of revision of the copyright law, which do not sort of, um, has nothing to say about uh, recorded sound or uh, wax recordings or player piano rolls or the telharmonic dynaphone, right? Um, but what's interesting here, what is very different, and this is very critical, is that is no longer just sort of like writers and authors and sort of publishers and men who see themselves as sort of arbiters of culture um, who are involved in the writing of these laws. And now it's all minimal, right? So George David Putnam's in the room where Black Bill wrote this, and um, Edmund Clarence Stedman, the, the poet and um, lecturer, is sort of in there too. Uh, but you also have the sort of men who represent the American Association of Telephone Directory Publishers, right? <laughs> and the sort of uh, organization of music publishers. For the first time, is middlemen who are deciding um, um, our copyright laws, right? So it's not people who themselves are sort of creators or have a, no, you know, a vested sort of like notion in, you know, well, it interest in the notion that America becomes more free when information is allowed to circulate. Their primary concern is to, and responsibility in loyalty, is to the, 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 all the men who make money publishing telephone directories, or you know, the people who own big lithography businesses. And these are the only men in the room where they start sort of uh, hammering out the details of what will eventually become the Copyright Act of 1909. And all the high-flown moral rhetoric that was thrown around in the 1880s, up, leading up to the International Copyright Act, is sort of uh, nauseating and insincere as it may have been, you know, right? That's not even, they don't even give a uh, lip service to that, right? They basically say we had better leave the moral rhetoric at home. Now we're it's literally verbatim what uh, Herbert Putnam uh, says as he sort of calls the meeting uh, to order. And it is business. And they get their sort of act together and they bring it to uh, Congress. They, they write the law. This, like this becomes a thing now because copyright is so complicated and it encompasses so many things that Congress themselves do not want to write the law because they don't understand it. They basically say, you guys, you, this is your business. You deal with it. You bring us a law and we'll pass it. So that, like, that, that's literally like what they told Putnam. So they brought him a law. It's a very long law. And not only did they bring him a law, they bring them people to speak for the law, right? Famous people. Congress loves famous people. They love Noah Webster. They love Mark Twain. Twain came to speak in favor of the cover act, you know not. John Philip Sousa, very funny man. He comes and um, he says that we need a copyright because without a copyright, uh, these sort of like, no one's going to sing anymore. All they're going to do is like listen to uh, music on talking machines. The talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. We will not have a vocal cord left. It sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it, right? Like, it sounds like sort of uh, like what uh, the RIAA uh, basically was saying in 2000 and continues to say like today, that MP3s and Napster is going to ruin the production of music in this country. You know, who's going to make music if they can't get paid for it? Who's going to, uh, you know, create a march if they can't you know, get paid for like its sale? Um, what they didn't reckon for is that the talking machine advocates, um, the people who are creating these infernal machines, read the newspapers and they read that this bill was under discussion. And they come out in great number to sort of like give uh, the point of view of the little guy who was excluded from the discussion. And they're like, well, oh, hey, listen, every composer in the land is glad to get the advertising following the mechanical reproduction of their music. Um, it was regarded as the best of any form of advertising. The public is the one and the sole element which has been omitted in the consideration of this law. And they were right. And that's why it took 
three years to sort of like finally pass the Copyright Act of 1909. And when they eventually got like, it passed, um, it continues to expand, right? Um, there's a 28-year copyright term now, a 28-year renewal period. It expands the universe of copyrightable content, creates a compulsory license, where record companies pay can post their royalty for each song recorded and sold. Um, and Sue's is thrilled. We want a copyright of the future, he said. And he got one. But as they realized soon after 1891, the future soon becomes the past, and that's what happens almost immediately after um, the copyright of 1909 passes. This next slide is ridiculous. 67 years and 67 seconds. I'll just say that <laughs> in the book, I tell this some of the sort of um, interstitial period here through looking at Herbert Putnam's like long and august career as a of Congress. Um, he holds this sort of round table, he calls it, in the dining room. Uh, every every day, every day he has lunch with a uh, bunch of sort of like famous men uh, from various fields, from art, right? And so over like over the course of like the years, you know, becomes actual artists, then becomes actors and directors and like filmmakers, right? From commerce, so it starts becoming you know from like uh, these small sort of like businessmen to gigantic sort of like corporations, right? Science. Men of science um, come there. Um, we don't know what scientists are. Um, anyway, we've got 67 years and slightly less than 67 seconds. Um, I have a few slides left. Um, yeah, I'll go through these quickly. Um, basically, what happens is when sort of uh, Putnam dies in 1955, I'm in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, at like 93 years old. Um, right around the same time that uh, the space age begins. Uh, Sputnik's launched like in the sky and everything changes. Everyone's sort of like terrified. <laughs> like, what does this mean, right? There's this new future with all these new technologies that we don't really sort of like understand. How do we keep up with um, the Russians? Um, what John F. Kennedy thinks when he gets into office is, well, we keep up in the Russians with the libraries. We cut, like, how we as a nation sort of meet the challenges of the space age is by re-embracing a notion that is as old as the nation itself. That America as a whole benefits when information is able to circulate more freely among its citizens and among its people. That, that is how we sort of like grow as a people and grow to meet these challenges of tomorrow. And Kennedy says this to uh, Congress as he's authorizing the construction of a federal pavilion for the uh, 1964 World's Fair. Um, and the theme of the pavilion is challenge to greatness. And he says, listen, what this pavilion is going to be, it's going to be our answer to the Soviet, right? Um, that in America is a great nation, the challenge to greatness, because we have a mobility, intellectual mobility. People can start down here and like end up right there. My father can you know come over from Ireland and you know you know make a lot of money bootlegging you know I'm president, right? <laughs> you know? Like um, and like so part of the, like this exhibit, uh, this this ridiculous exhibit, it's really sort of I wish I had been alive um, to see it. There's like a weird theme park ride called Challenge to Greatness where the star of the TV show Wagon Train intones a script written by Ray Bradbury about uh, encouraging people to sort of like face their tomorrows and like America always like embraces like change and it goes through all of this sort of yay America, God bless us all thing. And the idea culminates with a library. Not just any library, the library of the future. The American Library Association creates this exhibit called Library USA where um, this is the culmination of the exhibit, right? Where it sort of is an example of what libraries will be sort of in like the future and how libraries and sort of the computerization like thereof like is going to help America meet the challenge to greatness. And so you've got these gigantic Univac machines like down there that have all sorts of like information like stored like inside of them that you can access with like the click of a button. Um, You've got this thing called Dial a Book, 
where you pick up a phone and uh, the librarians on the end that basically like are giving you like reading you reviews of like books that you might want to sort of like access. Um, there's some really great quotes like from Kennedy here. I'm gonna try to find one of them for you. Uh, I'm almost. I promise I'm almost done here, uh, <laughs> folks. Um, what does he say? This is the really great quote. Um, ah, son of a gun, I can't find it. Um, anyway, oh yeah, here it is. Books and libraries and the will to use them are among the most important tools our nation has to diffuse knowledge, to develop our powers of creative wisdom. This is free culture in a nutshell, right? America is stronger when books and libraries are able to diffuse among the people and like become more creative, right? Um, and so as we've seen, um, every time that this sort of like notion burbles back up, into like American, the idea that like new technologies were going to help spread knowledge and make the nation more free. Um, people who have a financial interest in retaining that knowledge and making it more expensive always sort of push back, try to pass a new law. Um, and that's basically what happens. Um, when uh, Herbert Putnam dies, he's replaced by L. Quincy Mumford as librarian of, uh, librarian of Congress. And right around the time that Kennedy is calling for a challenge to greatness, Mumford is calling for a bunch of sort of uh, lawyers and middlemen to come together and revise um, the general copyright statute to sort of fit the realities of the machine age. I'm confronted daily with what are now being called the information explosion and communications explosion, he said. It is obvious to me that these revolutionary developments carry with them a profound challenge to creative endeavor. And our antiquated copyright law must be revised to meet this challenge. The longer this task is delayed, the harder it will be to accomplish, the more serious the loss for future generations. So the same thing happens in 1956 as happened in like 1906. Um, it takes 25 years for them to put this sort of like law um, together. But it's the same group of like lawyers and middlemen who get together. Um, uh, this is my favorite quote I've, I've ever read. Uh, well, Finkelstein, um, the uh, representative of the American Society of Composer, Composers, uh, Artists, and uh, I don't know what that guy stands for. It's the musician, like the uh, music. Right? Anyway, anyway, basically, like he stands up in like this meeting, and he sort of sets the tone. He's like, "Beware! Those who talk about a short term of copyright may be leading us into communism." <laughs> Isn't that an interesting sort of like difference of opinion? You've got Kennedy on one hand, right, building this exhibit that is basically a tribute to the notion that the free sort of like dissemination of information is what's going to differentiate America from communist Russia, right? And then, like in Washington, D.C., you've got people who represent the businesses that are producing, like, this knowledge that is supposed to be like in the libraries of being read, saying, well, if like um, uh, there's a short term of copyright, that's going to lead us to communism. Who's right? Who's going to win? Well, Kennedy was shot, you know? <laughs> Kennedy, Kennedy died. Um, and the Copyright Act of 1976 like, went through. Um, it went through, as everyone here knows, you know. That was when everything really, really, really changed. The new term lasted until 50 years after the death of the author. It further expanded copyright protections. It, any form of creative expression that originated in the United States would enjoy copyright protection from the moment of its creation, whether or not it had been formally registered. Um, I'll wrap this up, uh, this sort of tour through the history of copyright in the United States. Um, there's this guy named Watson Davis, who was very much a man of his time. He was an informaticist, an information scientist, and in the 1960s he was peddling this notion of a concept he called the universal brain. Um, in a speech to what the universal brain basically was, was the internet before the internet existed. Right? It was um, it was JSTOR, right? It was Pacer. It was every single like database that like we have today um, that is sort of partitioned and uh, walled off and uh, owned to the point where uh, accessing it without authorization um, with sort of like in bulk download 
It's the sort of thing that can lead you to be arrested and prosecuted and uh, feel so desperate that um, you hang yourself uh, with a belt in your own apartment. Right. Um, back in 1960, um, Watson Davis was thinking the universal brain, the universal library, the library of the future, seemed like an achievable thing. If only people would work together and recognize that there is national benefit in um, uh, allowing knowledge to disseminate among uh, the citizens of the republic, right? That a nation becomes more free when information is freely accessible. Um, and Davis tells the uh, National Microfilm Association in this speech, uh, is cooperation between librarians and organizations so difficult that one big library cannot be accomplished? The know-how exists, and we only need the let's do. The know-how still exists. And I guess we have one big library, you know, or you know, a billion sort of like uh, libraries that could theoretically be, you know, connected like one day. Um, because the same technology that inspires some people to dream of a better world can inspire apocalyptic visions in others. Meeting the challenge of greatness depends entirely on how greatness is defined. Now, who is doing the defining? I suppose I'll, 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 I'll leave you with that. I'll leave you with this. Um, I spoke in November to um, the group of librarians who were in D.C. for the American Library. Library Association uh, convention. I um, actually led a panel. Um, and the topic of the panel was um, is there still a role for libraries and librarians in the 21st century? Um, and I, I, I don't know if the people that asked me to moderate the discussion were happy with me because um, I dismissed the topic with the first line of my uh, introduction. And I said, well, yes, ask and answer. Yes, there is a role for librarians and like libraries in like the digital age. Of course there is. Because the library has never just been about like the books, right? It's never just been about um, the physical materials contained therein. A library is an idea. Right? A library is the physical embodiment of the notion of free culture. And if anything, like, the notion of free culture is stronger, sort of like today, than it's ever been um, at any time in this nation, like, or in world history, I think. There are so many, just the act of logging on, like, to the internet and, like, watching some dude play video games, <laughs> right? Or, you know, um, downloading, like, a, a paper or going to open library or doing whatever one does on, like, the internet. The fact that the internet sort of exists and continues to exist and allows people to connect, right, is the, the uh, apotheosis of the, the cultural brain, the thing that I mentioned, like, at the beginning of my talk, right? It is Watson Davis's, like, universal brain. Ah, the information is out there. The know-how um, exists. We only need the let's do. I think that's the role that librarians uh, must play uh, as we continue to move into the uh, 21st uh, century. It's always been about curation, right? About putting together a collection that makes sense and giving people the tools to use it and interpret it, right? You can have all the information in the world. It doesn't make a difference if you don't know how to read or don't know how to use it or sort of like access it. Um, and there will always be a need, and I think the need is more desperate than ever now for uh, people whose mission and um, meaning is to make sense of that knowledge and to help other people make sense of that knowledge. And I think Aaron Swartz was one of those people. Uh, we can all be those people if we just remember how important it is um, to be that person and how important the notion of free culture um, has been to American history. Um, and how
that's what's the idea that stealing is, um, is the stealing is stealing statement um, is. Um, I talked for a really long time. Uh, if there are any questions or thoughts or comments, I would, I would welcome them. And if not, that's really great too. But thank you, Ray, for having me. And thanks to both of you uh, for uh, coming out. I'll even thank those loud kids who were so happy <laughs> to get some cheese. Free cheese. And cheese. cheese. Yeah. Um, well, I wish there were more people here because yeah, I think it yeah. was a, a really thought provoking journey from 1450. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate your insights. Thank you. That's so. The no, I was that. I think that we saw the day next Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I missed the bit. The, the, my first battery on the camera died. So there's going to be a gap. That's so which, uh, uh, it's just an irritation. Um, but um, you, it's kind of funny that you mentioned the, 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 the quote, uh, was it Is that who it was? Yeah, yeah. Uh, about the libraries being you know, communism. I remember when I was a grad student, I worked at a bookstore. And uh, there was a guy who was my manager, and I remember talking, you know, the, the, the library seemed like a foreign concept to him. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you can just go to the library and get a card and take out books. I was like, well, what does it cost? He's like, well, nothing. It's like, and, and he really, his responses were almost that it was sort of this creeping communism. And I had never in my life encountered that. Yeah. And it was, it was such a bizarre to me way to view it. Um, because, I mean, you'll find no greater lovers of libraries than librarians. I mean, there's a reason that we do this sort of thing, uh, I think. Um, and it's, it's uh, uh, you know, in, in working in an institution of higher education, you know, there is all this information. And, but, you know, we do have a lot of students who struggle with yeah, how to access it. You know, when, when, and yeah, you have, yeah, you can have any number of, even if you were to say, you know, Whatever, all, all the available articles that you find on the internet, let's say they were valid, which of course, you know that's not true. Um, but let's just say they were. So how do you, how do you access that? I mean, you know, I mean, the Google search is going to give you, you know, millions of answers. You know, I mean, and that's one of the th the nice things about a database with with the, like a controlled language is that you can do these co like kind of commonly accepted terms, and a lot of people um, really struggle with how to use those resources. So there's, there's huge amounts of things there. I mean, even a small college uh, like Johnson, I mean, um, I know at one point we had some form of full text access to 35,000 journal titles through our various databases. And, but the real struggle was then, you know, getting people to them and, and teaching them how to use them. And, um, and, and, you know, kind of realizing, getting people to realize just how much there was and on how almost any obscure topic, even in a relatively small library. You know, there, there, there's valid information. Um, but, um, yeah, so often the challenge, it seems, you know, we, we you know, I, I, was, I was amazed to read a book that referenced JSTOR and OCLC <laughs> and the uh, your journal serials crisis, the uh, serial, serials uh, crisis, uh, pricing crisis. Um, because, you know, we've seen that, uh, and I'm sure you've seen that too. So what, I'm a special collections librarian, special collections. so um, I believe print will last forever. <laughs> I hope so. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, we've we've seen you know the every year it's what about eight percent increase in, in prices for your, your, yeah. your typical journal title, and it's been going on for about thirty years or something like that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it's and, and you know you see it, and I remember taking journal my oh, my oh. serials class. In, <laughs> My serials class, feel free to take some food if you want. No, um, my serials class in, in grad school, uh, the guy was writing the textbook as, during, during the class. He'd like a few chapters and things so the reading and, and sort of giving feedback. So we were kind of being used for our cheap labor for <laughs> feedback, but I don't think we might. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he found, you know, these slides from the University of Washington where some kids have put together these slides on journal prices. There were some, like, cardiology journal. 30 to 50 grand per year. It's crazy. And it was like quarterly. Oh, yeah. And and you know, they had these graphs. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, for a year you could buy a BMW or you could buy access to this journal. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just absolutely amazing. It's it's just that's it's astounding the prices that 
our church, especially when, you know, in, in so many cases, it seems like um, you know, the editors are unpaid. Um, you know, they kind of do it for the love of it or for prestige. Um, and, you know, in publishing, you know, uh, in, you know like a publication like uh, Science or Nature, you know, people wanted to get their research published in the best journals, you know, so I mean, to, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a feather in their yeah. cap, it can help them advance their careers, um, and so there's a real incentive for them to get into these, um, these really prestigious publications, um, and yeah, boy, boy, do we end up paying on, on, the, on, on the access end, um, they're, they're in to make money. <laughs> It, it, it really is like a natural, like, it's, it's a logical sort of conclusion or extension of like the sort of hyper, hyper capitalist mindset to sort of information. Like, the sort of information wants to be expensive. Uh, great. Like, we'll see how expensive, like, everything, like, um, can get. And it's really destructive. And um, the article that Ray referenced, I, I just wrote an article for Slate about this website called Sci-Hub um, that is sort of responding to the cereals pricing crisis by um, basically sort of um, offering access to any uh, academic article you'd ever want, like for free. And they do it by sort of just formalizing a process that everyone has always done. If you need to access a database and you don't have access, but your friend does, well, hey, we you learn your passwords, it's right, and just like get in there, right? What, Sci-Hub is, is it sort of like, it, it is sort of like dumb data for every single like database, like ever. It has these sort of like passwords that it just, you put in the DOI of the article you want, and it sort of automates the sort of, you know, search and retrieval process, and then it gives you the article, and it stores it cognitively in its own like database, and like uh, Elsevier is like, um, filed suit against this website, um, last year, claiming that it's doing sort of like grave sort of injury to like its, its business. First of all, that's laughable because they made $1.8 billion in profit last year. Second of all, the injury is entirely self-inflicted, you know, like people, no one is born felonious, right? You know, like if things are readily sort of accessible or, you know, sold at a reasonable price, I think more often than not, like, People want to sort of like follow like the law, but when like you're charging fifty thousand dollars per atom for uh, journal access, like who's gonna pay? It boggles the mind. Some people will probably Some, Harvard, yeah, Maine, yeah, Harvard, the, Harvard, the top yeah. medical schools will. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but of course, that's why there's also uh, the, you have the, the fees and um, the the. The, the borrowing limits of certain X five articles per year, I think, um, is, is the yeah. Well, that's something we run into. Is you know, we, and, and are you familiar with that, Justin? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, we there are times we will get a zealous researcher, and you know, I don't know if we go by calendar or after fiscal year, whichever it is. We go part of the way through the year, and boom, someone hits that limit because we found someone who has requested a bunch of articles, and so we can't request anything else from that journal for the rest of the year. Sometimes we will suggest that there to um, uh, to seek other local options um, where possible. To, because we do have um, relatively closely, we have a, dis a dispersed uh, distance population. Um, there are other libraries in the state. Some of which are much much bigger than uh, the, you know the, the publics or some of the smaller academic libraries. Um, and if you know if they can get in there and search their databases as a, as a guest. Well, it's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing cycle where you have these, um, you know, the, 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 the publisher wants to make, uh, you know, whatever profit margin, and so they raise the price, which then causes people to drop the subscription. So then they need to make more money, so they raise the price, and more people drink their subscriptions. And it's, and it's been going on, you know, yeah, for 30 or more years. And it just keeps happening. And, and you know, it, I mean, it has to stop at some point, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. it seems. <laughs> I mean, that's like the, <clears throat> that's the function of these projects like Sci-Hub, I think, you know. Um, at, at least that's what the woman who um, sort of founded that website.
Kharkov site. She's this Kazakh uh, researcher who is now in hiding somewhere in the Balkans. Um, but she's like, look, this is like, this is the path to open access. You know, like the um, uh, publishers have resisted the open access movement for so long because it makes no sense for them to do it. But now there is my website where, you know, you can't stop it. Like, I will give free access like to everyone. Soon, like Elsevier and Science Direct and all these places, right? Well, like, there will be no reason for them not to, like, make their stuff open access. And I think that's a little bit simplistic, but, like, I, I get what she basically means. Like, I get what she's saying. Like, like people who work within systems tend to advocate for incremental like solutions and change because they have to live and exist within those systems, right? Yep. Um, it requires sort of an outsider who's not beholden to those systems to say, well, screw it, incrementalism. Like, like um, burn it all down. Yeah, burn, burn it all down, down. exactly. Um, for better or for worse, that's like, that's what we have. Like, I think there's, even if this woman gets shut down, there's going to be another one, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't put this stuff back in the box. No. No, you really you can't. Really, really can't. Um, yeah, and that's. Uh, well, that was one thing I thought. You know, you reference you know the people who work outside the system. You know, because of Aaron Swartz, you know, he didn't seem to fit inside of any system, like for whatever reason, natural inclination or habit. But and you know, he always he really you know in your presentation just, just chafed at, at these structures, and that. What drove him to, to take the action he did? And, and in reading your book, I, I kept thinking, it's like, oh, you know, it's like, you know, your your uh, your program is just hitting it too fast. I mean, you know, I just keep thinking, it's like, oh, if you just been sneakier about yeah, it, yeah, yeah, maybe you would have gotten away with it. <laughs> maybe not that I should advocate breaking the law, <laughs> you know. But it's like, I just, oh, if you if you just been a little bit more clever, it's like it's, it seems like the program, in, in, especially in the initial stages, was like a brute force. Yeah. Uh, sort of thing, and if it had flown a little quieter, um, unlike the jets that kept passing over us, um, <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, maybe, maybe you got, would have gotten away with it. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, and it, it, that's another thing, right? It's, it can be hard for people who hate systems so much, like, and who you know, shy from them to sort of understand what it takes to, like, not attract the sort of, like, um, wrath of system. You have to work in an organization to understand, like, how annoyed you're going to make, like, people, like, <laughs> just what a pain in the butt it is, like, when, 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 when the server goes down, you know, and how just resentful people will be of you for, like, ruining, like, their, their weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you talked about, you know, the JSTOR shutting down access to all of MIT, and I thought, oh, you know, our, our, our little college people complain, you know, when the databases are offline for routine maintenance that they've known about for a week in advance. <laughs> you know, and to have something, a database that large, you know, because we have certain collections, by no means the entire piece, because we just can't afford it. Um, you know, to, yeah, to, to have at such a large and competitive and important institution to just then lose that resource, oh, I mean, it must have driven some people to write up a wall for sure. Oh boy. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I really enjoyed this. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, tell your friends. I I love talking about this stuff. I travel. I don't mind talking for an audience of three people. <laughs> um, I really appreciate. Listen to me talk for gosh two hours about yeah. like copyright and, and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so no, I mean it was, it was, it was a pleasure. Uh, yeah, the uh, yeah I, I, I really enjoyed your book. I appreciate you coming up. It, it, it would have been nice if more people from the community had showed up. You know, I mean I know that even with the, the you know when we had the event two years ago, which was about book banning, um, you know we mostly got other librarians and. It was in Montpelier, it was down the street from the ACLU office, so the people from the ACLU just walked out. <laughs> you know, so it was it was people who were, you know, who were basically sort of insiders. And, um, and I mean, it's because to 
me, it's, it's interesting, you know, sort of these things. Was, I, I remember when Napster happened, yeah. you know, and kind of what a big deal that was. I think my father-in-law still hates Lars over at Metallica, <laughs> in part because of that whole thing. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, the kids today, I mean, you know, working in, in the high school, I'm trying to think, so this year's seniors were born in 98 or 99. They, they do not know a non-digital world. And, you know, all, all of these, these issues that we've sort of had to adapt to and learn about as they come along, they, they've always existed for, for their entire lives. Um, and, yeah, they're, they're, it's like, oh, you know, I want to watch this movie? Nah, I'll get it on BitTorrent. You know, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm thinking a lot about um, the notion that, like, what really, most problems with society, I think, and I'm really oversimplifying here. Um, people are afraid of the unfamiliar. People don't understand like things that are unfamiliar, like to them, right? Um, well, it's going to be very, very soon. I think we're already like starting to be in that world. Like people aren't familiar, but with like printed books or with like physical media, you know, like it's going to like we'll come to the point. Where like like we're the, uh, we're gonna be the odd one, <laughs> you know? Um, the, the laws are gonna have to adapt. The, 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 I don't know. Maybe they won't. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the law tries. Yeah. You know, and it's always behind the eight ball because, especially in the field of technology, where things have just changed so fast. And how 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 is legal system ever going to keep up and you know with some of the ways that it's tried it seems have been terrible um, you know I mean for instance again looking at one of your pieces uh, Matthew Fay was that his name what's his name Keys Matthew, Matthew Keys, Keys. Yeah. Um, two years for says, giving out his password to the back end of the LA Times um, yeah. system um, that seems yeah, that's it. yeah right. <laughs> exactly. It just doesn't. It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, but, you know, it, it made me chuckle. Your, you know, just the quote about the living in this information, and, you know, explosion and communications explosion from what was in the sixties. Yeah, <laughs> I just kept thinking, oh, buddy, you don't even. Know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what's coming. You know what's coming. <laughs> no, it's coming. And that's actually really interesting because, like, when they were putting that law together, like, they were very much trying to sort of have a law that was sort of narrow enough to sort of deal with the world they had, yet broad enough to sort of deal with whatever might like come mm -hmm. next. Like, that's basically why we got to the point where they're like, "Great, anything, like, everything's in a copyright now. We have no idea what the next like technology is going to be." They were terrified of creating that jukebox exemption um, for like a until the '76 law passed. Um, a couple performance, like basically, songwriters were losing a lot of money because they didn't get any royalties when their songs were played in jukeboxes. Because in 1909, like they turned jukebox like applied to something completely different than what jukeboxes evolved like eventually to be. Like a jukebox in 1909 was basically like a personal stereo system where it was one of those old things on like a wooden cabinet where you put on like old timey headphones and like crank like a thing. And like that was a jukebox, right? But then, like the 1950s, like when there's like a jukebox in every hamburger joint in America and like they're spinning the Everly Brothers and like whatnot, songwriters are like, what the heck? Like we should be making so much money like from this. And like yet, like we were not because those dummies in 1909 didn't like foresee like the rise of world alternation. Uh, so they are like, we do not want that to happen. Everything is copyrighted from the moment it was uttered. Yeah, yeah. It's aggravating. A, a, a further question that that I thought of sort of sarcastically earlier today is: so who owns the copyright to your book? Scribner does. Scribner does. Yeah. And for how long? Uh, for forever, um, functionally until seventy years after I die. Yeah. 
people ask me this all the time. They're like, are you going to put the book in the public domain? <laughs> Why is it a Creative Commons license? No. <laughs> Look, A, you are greatly you know, like overestimating the amount of leverage I have in like, the contract <laughs> negotiations. Um, but, yes, listen, this, I often sort of make this point. Um, my book's going to go out of print, like, probably fairly soon. Like, maybe not next year. Maybe not in three years, but maybe like, Five to ten years from now, like this book will be out of print. You know, it's, I, it is like, and when that happens, like, it is not going to go back in print, and people are not going to be able to like find it. You know, and under the first copyright act that we had in America, right? It, uh, the Copyright Act of like 1790, that, that wouldn't have been a problem because gradually, like, in 14 years. Like if when a work is outlived its commercial usefulness, like that's going to like it'll just become in the public domain, right? Now, um, when the work outlives its like commercial usefulness, it just sits there in like uh, archives, and it will never ever ever like come out like to the public um, because unless I really really like push for it or press for it, and even then, like I think there's a clause in my contract where I'm like if it goes out of print for a while and they don't see any commercial viability, I can buy the rights back. What's that going to cost? What's that going to cost me? <laughs> I'm not a rich man, right? <laughs> like, yeah, script now is a copyright. Don't want to tell any time. Uh, buy your copies now. You're not going to be able to find this book in five years. I guarantee that. The, um, yeah, because, uh, um, yeah, that, that was one question I thought of, because, I mean, you know, the standard format seems to be, you know, the, the, what? The hardcover came out in just January, was it? Yeah. So probably next January there'll be a trade. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, those will kick around usually yeah, for, for a couple of years. Even though I wonder, working in acquisitions, I see, I've seen some things from certain more like academic publishers. When I purchase something, um, there's like a, even, even if I purchase it new, there's like a, almost like a print on demand date. I think some of the publishers, um, Paul Grave might be doing it. I'm not sure. I can't remember specifically. But, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I'll order it new. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's like one to three weeks. And I think that what, like, Amazon or other vendors are doing are then contacting the publishers, and they are doing print-on-demand copies. Um, and, you know, and then that way, because, I mean, you know, something like the, was it the, 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 the print-on-demand book machine, the EBM, is that what it's called? The, 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 there was one down at the North Shire Bookstore at one point. Yeah, there was one in the, there was one at the Harvard Bookstore in, in Cambridge. Yeah, and where you could just crank out, you know, you, you just select up whatever book you want and it'll crank it out in, what, like 10 minutes or something like that? I mean, it's nothing, it's not fancy, you know, um, but it's, it's a freshly printed book. And, and I mean, I wonder if, you know, we'll see to a certain extent. I mean, I hope that I really want the, the physical printed book to survive yeah. because I just love it. I love holding a book, and, you know, um, and uh, but you know, I wonder if, if publishers will try and if there's going to be sort of a, a monetize or back catalog by yeah yeah through this like dispersed sort of publication. Um, I mean, no, but yeah. it's interesting. We're seeing a lot more photography and popular fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like bestseller list. It's the stuff under that. It's been very interesting to see that. It's mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Hmm. And, yeah. I know, you know, at, at our level, we, we see a decline in print circulation, in part because that's the, 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 due to the article databases. Ours is going up. So I'm yeah. mostly popular fiction, but it's, it's increasing quite a lot. It's been interesting. Really? Yeah. It's really, cool. It's really cool. I um, was pleasantly surprised <laughs> <laughs> to see, like, the past few years, it's steadily gone up. Not uh, hugely, but enough to make be noticeable. So. Good. I hope it continues. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we'll wrap it up. Okay, I guess that's it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I could talk forever. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just not in front of a lot of people.